All right, we're starting the webinar. Um, our Rethinking Work series, we will have to give people space to join and time. Um, and very excited to welcome everyone back um, to our continuing series this semester with the leading office in the field. So we'll give it a few more minutes. And in the meantime, I want to welcome everyone here. Um, I'll see familiar names and faces, uh, which is fantastic uh, because it's going to be a terrific conversation and very timely. So, um, So what we are going to do is ask everyone as we are going to go through the presentation uh, to put your questions in the Q&A tab and definitely um, use the chat if needed. Um, but we prefer everyone in the Q&A section. We are also recording this session. As we know, it's in the middle of the day and um, some of our colleagues were, are not able to make it. Therefore, they requested a rerun and the uh, recording of this session will be available to everyone. So absolutely welcome. So let me just start with the introductions. Um, I'm Anna Tavis. Department Chair and Clinical Professor here at uh, um, New, uh, NYU School of Professional Studies uh, in the Department of Human Capital Management. And I will be hosting our two distinguished guests and authors, uh, Steve Garcia and uh, Dan Fisher. Let me give you a little bit of the background on both of them. Um, I will start with Dan, actually. Dan was on our advisory board for the coaching and technology, um, sorry, for the um, executive coaching and organizational and consulting degree and provided us with a lot of really valuable insights as to how we need to structure the program. Dan is a consulting psychologist and a co-founder of both the Institute for contemporary leadership, as well as contemporary leadership advisors, a consultancy that Dan is leading. Um, Dan's background is really, really interesting and very relevant. Uh, he's a clinically trained trauma and forensic psychologist and uh, has gained invaluable wisdom from working as an attending psychologist on New York Hospital's world-renowned burn unit and in the New York City court system. Dan is um, a PhD clinical psychologist and he is a New York native, even though he left us for the schools on the other coast, but he's back here and um, his co-author, Steve, is also a managing partner at Contemporary Leadership Advisors, uh, where he helps clients build a leading, build and lead faster, higher impact, and more adaptive organizations. Um, uh, prior to joining Contemporary Leadership Advisors um, and working with Dan, Steve worked on Capitol Hill for the U.S. Congress Office of Technology Assessment. I think some of those people on in the uh, um, on the Capitol Hill can use your help, Steve. And we're going to hear more. <laughs> um, so, um, and Steve uh, holds both an MBA uh, from the University of Virginia as well as um, EDD. Um, uh, in adult learning from um, North Carolina State University. So without further ado, I have your book here, The End of Leadership as We Know It, and there can't be a more appropriate moment 
to discuss what leadership really stands for or need to, needs to stand for at the times like what we have now. So without further ado and distraction, I want to give the mic to uh, Dan and Steve to walk us through what they discovered when they were doing their research. Take it Great. away. Thanks. Thanks, Anna. Steve and I are both very excited to be here and incredibly impressed with um, what you and Woody and your colleagues have all built um, at NYU. And it's it's really an honor to be able to talk about these issues with everybody. And um, as we had a chance to just touch base before we joined everybody, it is a particularly interesting time to be talking about the end of leadership as we know it. And um, I, if people on the call are like me and Steve and Anna, um, you're probably distracted and thinking about what's going on in the world right now and how just overall dangerous it is for so many people, regardless of whatever your thoughts are on this, we're in a perilous uh, moment. And interestingly enough, um, not to make light of this, but Steve and I were both big REM fans. And we are big REM fans and we were in college. And when we were thinking about what do we want to call this book, um, a lot of our thinking had to do with how things traditionally worked no longer work anymore. And so when we thought about all of the different words, we were taken back to it's the end of the world as we know it and we feel fine. And hopefully we're not prescient. <laughs> um, but REM song is very interesting because it's all about how things start with an earthquake. Um, we run into the eye of the hurricane. We're churning. The world serves its own needs. The, the words are all very relevant to what's going on today. And what's interesting, what we always felt about the song was that uh, it's really hard to understand. It's a very ambiguous song. If you ask somebody to explain the song to you, they'll probably be able to explain what they think some of the things mean, but it is um, very, very ambiguous. And that is what the world is like today, right? Steve's going to walk us through what's going on in the business environment and why you need a different operating model to really be able to achieve goals uh, in these contemporary times. But these same principles go for what's going on in the world right now. There's a ton of volatility. Things are so interconnected that you change one thing and all of a sudden it impacts multiple other things. And so decisions where you think things are pretty clear and make sense are no longer nearly as certain. The uncertainty is really great and the level of ambiguity around things is really heightened. And all you need is for a particular video, a tweet, Something like that completely changes the landscape at times. So Steve's going to give us a really nice overview and description of what that looks like um, within the business environment, but we're all living it right now. And we're all, as Anna said, at the mercy to a certain degree of our leaders. And so it just shows how leadership is all that more, all that more critical than it ever has been. And some of the, ex you want leaders with experience, but some of the experience that leaders have, if they're calling upon that um, to drive their ongoing strategy, um, we may struggle as a result of that. So um, Steve, do you want to go ahead and um, share the um, share the deck and we'll just go over quickly our, our agenda for our time together and um, Steve and I both are blessed with the gift of gab. So we're going to try to make sure we we get through things as, as quickly as possible. So we have time for questions at the end. And so if we need to cut some things short to make sure we get an opportunity to hear from you, we will. And we're actually going to try to get some input from everybody in the chat um, and in some polls that we're going to do. So uh, get ready to actually be participating in this. So we're going to talk a little bit about the situation we find ourselves in and what we need to do to meet these challenges. And then what are the adaptive leadership fundamentals required to succeed in all of this volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity, and avoid the common traps that leaders fall into here. 
So um, to get our juices flowing and to um, sort of hit home um, the message about how things can be somewhat ambiguous, I wanna play a little game with everybody. And I need you all to promise me that if you have played this game before, you will sit this one out, okay? Um, only because it, you know it's, it's not gonna be fair to everybody else. So if you played this game before, I want you to sit it out, but hopefully you've never seen it. Um, I'm gonna ask you, uh, Steve, if you wanna put our first one um, up on the screen there. Uh, what, what's this? What word is this? Who can guess in the chat um, what this word is? Wow, not surprising. Oh my God, look at this. Anna, you've got all of these smart folks. Well, of course, Melanie Staff Parsons gets it right away. You've got a lot of uh, a lot of really smart people here. Jay, Hope, Joe, Tracy, um, Ryan, terrific. Okay, they got it. Complexity. Um, next one, Steve. All right, how about this one, folks? Oh, it's almost as if these people have played the game before. Look at that, Michelle, Melanie, Jay, Jill, and hey, Michelle. Um, all right, great. Disruptive change. Steve, next one. All right. All right, again, same, the, the, the same characters keep getting these really, really quickly. Okay, good. Radical unpredictability, good. Next one. All right, Solomon, Jay, everybody's just knocking these off. Ambiguity, good job. Steve, next one. <laughs> Jay with cheese. All right. Hope hope nails it. The, the word of the day, the world is in chaos. All right, Steve, next one. All right, how about this one, folks? Try to figure this one out. All right, let's let's go, guys. Try to figure this one out because we don't have a ton of time. We got to get to the rest of the uh, presentation. All right, Jay with the question marks. All right, try to figure this one out because we got to go. Anna with, with, a, with a good attempt, transformation, that's not it. Let's try to figure this one out. Tracy's totally lost. Well, isn't that like what the world is, right? Welcome, welcome. This is basically on an hourly basis. I have this, but try to figure this one out. All right, I think we're getting it. I think um, Megana and Emma and, oh, I like Goldman's one, that's nice, but um, you guys are close. Uh, if you, we combine yours together, it's try to figure this one out. Got it, guys? Good job. So what changed? You were knocking these out. They were You were killing it. I mean, really impressive. You, you all were just bam, bam, bam. And then I give you one more and everybody's flummoxed. And it takes a long time for us to get this. And that's because you're human and like everybody else and because this exercise works. And by the way, this exercise was gifted to us by David Peterson, um, our late partner, uh, friend and, and mentor. And all we did was change one little thing. Exactly, Jill, the pattern changed and it was hard to shift gears after that. Exactly. One little thing. The prior to this, the anytime there was more than one word, there was a space in between. And all we did was take out the space. The vowels, you knew, you knew that. You already had that pattern down, but we changed one little thing about the pattern and all of a sudden we're flummoxed. That's the world we live in. 
and it gets really hard. And so, Steve, I'm going to pass the mic over to you to talk a little bit more about how this plays out in the business environment, and then we can talk more about what leaders need to do to address it. Great. Thanks, Dan. Um, and thanks for having us, everyone. Pleased to, pleased to have you with us today. Um, so both Anna and Dan alluded to this, but the, um, the business context has really changed, right? We are far more interconnected than we ever have been before. Uh, you know, we see this, and, and we well, we see this in the fact that we've gone from like zero to sixty percent of the world is connected via the internet. Uh, air travel has tripled. Global trade is, I think, it's twelve x what it was in in nineteen eighty, um, and all this interconnectivity creates a uh, tremendous opportunity. There's all sorts of you know, new business models, uh, whether it's you know, streaming services or Bitcoin or you know, um, Airbnb, et cetera, that is enabled by this connectivity. But the connectivity also creates a lot of challenges. And in, in, in a really hyper-connected environment, um, you, it's far harder to understand cause and effect or to predict outcomes over time. Right, so we've really gone from a you know a complex environment. Or I'm sorry, from a complicated environment to one that's like tremendously complex. And one analogy we like to use is really um, a jigsaw puzzle and a Rubik's cube. In, in you know in a jigsaw puzzle, you can have a really complex jigsaw puzzle with you know I don't know two thousand five thousand pieces, but there's a sort of a best practice or an algorithm that you can apply to solve for it, right? You can, you know, find all the corner pieces, you can get all the edges, you can start to, you know, um, uh, cluster the various pieces by color, right? And, you know, you can bang away at it. And over time, you're going to, you're going to get that puzzle, right? The way you solve that puzzle on a Tuesday night is the same as the way that you solve that puzzle on a Saturday morning, right? But in the case of a Rubik's cube, you've got the various parts are dynamically connected to one another, right? They're not statically connected. So, um, you know, when you, you know, try and change one little piece on one side of the cube, you can radically alter all the other sides at the same time, which makes it, at least for me, far harder to, to sort of solve for the Rubik's Cube. And that's the environment we're living in today, where everything is so hyper-connected and small changes can, you know, in one part of the world can have an like immediate global effect everywhere else. It just it just makes things much, much harder to understand and, and figure out. So in that, in that environment, um, the traditional enterprise operating model that I think we're all, you know, pretty familiar with starts to work a lot less well, right? So upfront planning, um, begin, is less effective when you've got a really rapidly changing environment. Um, you know, you might you might plan out for the next three, six, nine, 12 months, but if you know something happens um, they didn't expect, suddenly those plans are no longer valid, and a lot more unexpected things are happening. Um, similarly, you know, we're all used to a model where we sort of you know devise strategy at the top of the house and we cascade that down the hierarchy. Um, as it turns out, that creates a lot of delay um, and limits people's understanding. Dan and I have done research that shows for every level between the CEO um, and uh, an employee, um, understanding of the strategy and enterprise level decreases by 25%. So it's kind of like the game of telephone when we're kids where someone says something you know, to one friend and sort of makes its way down the chain and it comes out really garbled um, at the other end. And we just don't have time for that in, in an environment where the pace of change is, is so much quicker. Um, organizational silos really undermine uh, the collaboration we need to solve complex problems. So we, we manage uh, sort of vertically in organizations, but the way we create value is sort of horizontally. You'd be hard pressed to uh, you know, find a value stream map, a, you know, a business process that is not cross-functional in nature, but we continue to manage in, in, in silos and that creates, that creates challenges. Um, Top-down feedback. So we're, we're, we're really good at, um, you know, communicating our strategy top-down. Um, we're, we're a lot less good at getting feedback on that strategy sort of bottom-up. Um, I, the, 
the you know the typical em employee survey tends to really focus on you know engagement, um, trying to engage folks as opposed to really understanding their perspective on you know what's working or what's not working relative to what the organization is trying to achieve. And that real time feedback from the front lines is necessary to adapt um, to uh, changing conditions. And then finally, sort of the, the command and control approach um, reduces employee autonomy and engagement, you know, really when it's needed most. Um, you can certainly, you know, use that approach. If you've got a big carrot or a big stick, you can get people to do what you want, but you don't necessarily get the additional discretionary effort or the creative ideas that you would like to solve a lot of the sort of multifaceted problems that we, we deal with today. And you know, the implications for this mismatch between um, the world that we now live in and the traditional, um, you know, approach to managing organizations is really significant. Um, three quarters of organizations say that they struggle to execute strategy. Um, again, like what they plan up front, um, just they're not, they're not able to actually put that into practice. 77% uh, of companies say that they're ill prepared to deal with the disruption that they know is coming. Um, a third of all senior leaders report being extremely burned out. And some of my colleagues maintain the other two thirds are lying, that they're actually also extremely burned out. And then, you know, 900 billion in wasted transformation efforts, efforts every year. So really significant impact um, that, we're, that we're all dealing with. Um, and I think that makes that leading really challenging today. So the good news is that there are other ways of sort of organizing. Um, complex adaptive systems offer a, uh, you know, one approach that, you know, Dan and I are, you know, have seen work really well. Um, you know, complex adaptive systems are dynamic systems. They're all around us. So we see them everywhere we look, um, in nature, um, in um, social systems, in technology. Um, they're, they're systems that are made up of lots of individual autonomous parts that um, apply sort of standard rules and dynamically rewire themselves to change, um, to respond to changing environmental conditions. And if we look at this model, and in complex adaptive systems, why they may not be the most efficient method of organizing, um, um, they are far more adaptive. So the traditional command and, and control approach or the top-down hierarchy that we're, that we're familiar with works really well and in stable conditions, which I think is why it's thrived for so long. But you know, we would really argue that that's less successful in the, the more rapidly changing complex environment that we find ourselves in today. So specifically, um, the traditional enterprise operating model um, is one in which you know, we tend to plan upfront um, around you know, what the organization needs to do over, again, the next six, 12 months. Um, that is um, that plan then gets um, you know compartmentalized by function. Um, each function sort of is assigned a set of tasks that they need to perform. Um, we manage that sort of again to this top-down hierarchy. And any any variations, any any sort of outliers um, that need to get addressed are sort of relayed back up the chain of command for for centralized decision makers to sort of decide what to do. Um, and again, that works really well. Um, in stable environments, not so well in more adaptive circumstances. So the model on the left is really one where we sort of compare and contrast um, sort of the adaptive approach to the more traditional approach. So instead of um, upfront planning cycles, the adaptive approach really relies on rapid test and warn cycles, sort of an agile um, uh, method, if you will. Um, instead of aligning around tasks, it aligns around simple rules. Um, Activity is coordinated or orchestrated through ho informal horizontal networks and centralizing is, I'm sorry, and decision-making is much more decentralized across the organization. People are more empowered um, in the environment to, to, to act um, you know, as needed to respond to, to changes. So that's the model that we have seen work um, really well, um, again, in, in more complex environments. So, the, the book that um, that Anna shared shared with you um, at the start and that Dan and I just just authored is really the, the premise of that is that the again the environment has changed it's become uh, much more co complex and and uh, and faster that really demands a new adaptive operating model um, and what that requires is that leaders show up 
and behave in new and different ways. And oftentimes in ways that are sort of uh, counterintuitive to what you know has worked for them in the past, what they learned in business school, what their mentors have taught them, which, which, makes, it, which makes it challenging. So I'm gonna hand it back over to Dan to sort of talk about um, what are some of the traps that we see leaders fall into before we go into one specific one in the remainder of our discussion. Great. Uh, thanks, Steve. And um, I want to make sure that everybody pays close attention to what we're going to go over right now, because there's going to be a poll at the end of this asking for your input on which of these traps have you seen um, be most relevant um, in the work that you're doing, um, either with clients or at your uh, at your companies. So Steve and I landed on 10 key fundamentals that leaders need to be doing in order to manage the operating systems that Steve described that are necessary within these environments. And we had a longer list and we scaled it down to 10. So if there's others that you come up with or that you have, please share it with us. It may be on our list as well. But I'm going to very quickly in my native New Yorker way, talk through these 10 um, to give you a, a just a, a sense of what we're talking about here, and then if it's if it's of interest, definitely read the book. There's we go into great detail and some really good stories from some of the leaders that we interviewed and that we've worked with. So the first fundamental that leaders need to really embrace is that it's not about you, and the trap that you have to avoid is leading through your expertise rather than your relationships. Instead of seeing everyone solely as individuals with their own separate accountabilities, um, you need to start seeing the networks of people accomplishing what individuals can't do well on their own. Once you see the power of these networks, you'll be extra motivated to invest in those relationships because that's how things get done. The second um, fundamental is we call the vulnerability, the vulnerability paradox. And the trap you want to avoid is projecting confidence at the expense of humility. And here we channel a lot of what Benet Brown has preached, which you're probably familiar with. Leaders who lean into their failability and express vulnerability have an easier time navigating the disruptive world that we're in than those who deny it. In fact, those folks are very scary and they're the ones with their hands on the wheel right now and key parts of the world were in trouble. Amongst other important benefits, um, of being vulnerable, it allows you to stay current because you don't assume you know things. You're gonna be listening very carefully for changes going on and you know that it's okay to be uncertain. We'll talk about that as another key fundamental. Um, stop strategizing and start doing. And the trap to avoid here is separating strategizing from executing. So strategic planning, which we love and we do a lot of, <laughs> offers several benefits for companies in stable environments. It clarifies the leader's thinking by investigating and validating their assumptions and logic about the business. It generates a single forward-looking vision on which the organization and its stakeholders can align. But in the complex environments that we're describing, Things don't stand still while the organization perfects their plans. By the time middle managers get the stone tablets from up high, their front line might look very different from what the leaders initially assumed. So leaders need to shorten that time between what they plan and when they collect feedback on what's working and what's not. Otherwise, they and the organizations risk spending time and resources on outdated goals. And instead of upfront planning followed by a long period of doing, leaders need to continually sense and respond so they can pivot in real time. Um, the next fundamental is all about freeing up your people, uh, freeing your people with purpose-driven, simple rules. So the trap to avoid is talking about purpose without operationalizing it. Having a very clear purpose, which allows for alignment on simple rules that employees can follow, allows for a greater degree of autonomy, engagement, and alignment and collaboration. So there's some great examples of Companies have done a really nice job of just really clarifying for their people simple rules they need to follow and it allows them to go ahead and operate without having to be micromanaged. Uh, next fundamental is why community organizers consistently beat superheroes. And the trap to avoid here is as a leader thinking you have to save the day instead of building teams that solve problems. And 
I always think back to the 2008 election um, where the opposition made fun of Obama for being a community organizer, which is ironic because in our mind, that's the ideal model for a leader in the complex and interconnected world that we're operating in. Leaders need to resist the desire and pressure to be the hero and instead activate heroic behaviors in the network. Next fundamental is viva la resistance. And the trap to avoid is overcoming resistance to change rather than working with it. So leaders need to treat resistance differently than they've been taught. Rather than seeking to overpower the resistance with authority or pure logic, leaders need to respect and work with the resistance in order to enable change that works and doesn't lead to chaos. They need to bring the organization to the edge of chaos, but, but not over it. Um, next fundamental is resilience beats efficiency. And the trap to avoid is cutting costs to the point of becoming brittle. Um, talked earlier, the distinction that we're dealing with these days is going from complicated problems that are like jigsaw puzzles to complex problems that are more like the Rubik's cube where you change one thing and it changes everything else to now we're playing with Jenga where you pull one thing out at times and because things are so brittle, your entire supply chain drops down and no, you can no longer do business. So this aggressive pursuit of efficiency um, that we've done in stable environments where we could really predict cause and effect much better um, is no longer very helpful in unstable environments um, where it just makes us incredibly fragile and small unforeseen complications can break the entire operation um, and, you know, going back to this, what's the general problem in, in currently globally right now between Ukraine and the Middle East, we may see a lot of changes in supply chain and things of that sort. Um, finally, the, uh, let's see, the, the siren song of certainty, another key fundamental, the trap to avoid is seeking certainty at the expense of reality. Leaders like everyone else crave certainty and it provides a certain sense of security and stability and control. Um, they feel like they know what to expect and what is expected of them, and it makes them less anxious as they make decisions and plan. Um, you know, maybe in the days when things were a little less interconnected, that was a little bit more realistic. But in our current VUCA environment, a posture of certainty is no longer an asset. It's a trap. It causes leaders to lock in on preconceived notions that may well turn out to be wrong as the market shifts unexpectedly or as the enemy shifts, you know, unexpectedly. Um, and it also stifles creativity. It leads us to stick with what we know and to value established ideas over uh, new approaches. And then our last two are data-driven data decisions still need a driver. So the trap to avoid is replacing judgment with just data. Smart leaders rely on data and intuition um, in their judgment rather than over-relying just on the data. They, they integrate them. Um, and that's, that's really critical. You want to listen to your gut, but you want it to be informed by data, but you don't want to ignore the judgment that you've, that you've developed over the years. And then finally, the last fundamental is when best isn't best and the trap to avoid is assuming best practices are right for your situation in the complex volatile world that we're operating in. Oftentimes what was the best practice no longer applies and you're going to get yourself in a whole heap of trouble if you assume that that it does. All right, Steve, do we have time for the poll, do you think, right now? Hey, uh, yeah, let's do it quick. Okay, great. So we're going to go ahead and put up a poll. And what we'd like you to do is just let us know, of these um, 10 different fundamentals, just pick the top three that you've seen the most in your organizations working with the leaders, either as if you're an outside consultant or you're internal. We're really curious. Of these 10, which are the ones that really stand out to you as, yeah, I see this happening and it's problematic? All right, just give you maybe one more minute to go ahead and choose those three and we'll uh, get a chance to see what uh, what folks 
folks came up with. You want to display the results? Yeah. Renee, you want it? Yeah. All right. Okay, so 40% 40 40 of folks listed leading through expertise rather than relationships. And close behind, oh, let's see, 51% said talking about purpose without operationalizing it. And then we had a lot of clustering around 35%, including projecting confidence at the expense of humility, separating strategizing from executing, and cutting costs to the points of becoming brittle. So a pretty good, pretty good variability um, across here with the uh, the winner being talking about purpose without operationalizing it. Well, uh, Steve is going to talk about one uh, of these fundamentals in particular and how um, we've gone about working with leaders and organizations to to address that. So Steve, handing the mic back over to you. Thank you, Dan. So, um, yes, yeah, so we're going to share with you the first one, which we talk about, which is it's not about you. So I think traditionally, when people thought about leadership, they've seen it as a set of competencies or a set of capabilities associated with an individual. And what Dan and I are recommending is really reframing it to define leadership not as a set of capabilities or traits or behaviors, but to define it as a relationship between and between two different between two or more people. So we're looking at leadership from the standpoint of the relationship between individuals as opposed to the capabilities of any one individual in the system. So why, why do we think that's important? Um, so I'm going to start with a quick analogy here. Uh, we're all familiar with the substances graphite and diamond. Uh, graphite is dull, soft, opaque. It's used as a lubricant in industrial applications. Diamond is brilliant, it's hard, it's transparent. Um, it's used you know, for, for cutting in industrial applications. So you know, these two substances could not be any more different in terms of their properties, but they're both made entirely of carbon. So how is that possible? Um, go ahead in the chat, you know, answer the question, how can two things that are so radically be, be, that are so radically different be comprised and made up of entirely the same thing? What do you guys think? Pressure, yes. And what that pressure does, thank you, Hope. Yes, oh, good, good, good. You guys are, 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 are quite the, uh, the chemists here. What that pressure does is it changes the way in which the carbon atoms are connected to one another. So in the case of graphite, they're connected in sheets that sort of slough off. And I have a big hunk of graphite. Sometimes I take with me and you know, you'd be amazed at how messy it is because literally graphite's flying everywhere when you, when you pull that thing out. Diamond, on the other hand, um, the, the carbon atoms are connected in this tetrahedral pattern, which creates some of the strongest bonds in the universe. So the, the key point I wanna make is that it's often not the, the properties of the parts, but it's the way that the parts are connected that have a really big outcome on, on performance. Um, so, and organizations are made of connections too. Here we see, we do a lot of organizational network analysis. Here we see, you know, one example, I think this is a medical device company if, I'm, if I remember correctly. Um, each one of these circles or nodes represents a person um, where there's lines between connecting those, those nodes, that, that represents a relationship. It could be, it could be a, a, a relationship related to trust or problem solving or sharing innovative practices. Um, the, the width of the, the line indicates sort of the, the number of relationships that those two nodes share and the size of the node represents um, how many in degrees or how many people identified that person as someone that they go to for making decisions, solving problems, um, you know, energizing them, et cetera. So, um, one of the things that we uh, well let me give let me give you another example of this so uh, here's a quick here's a quick you know uh, mini um, very simplified organizational uh, uh, network you see uh, three different groups uh, R and D red uh, marketing green sales uh, blue um, and a set of connections between these folks who is most likely to, to leave this organization. So go ahead and put that in the chat as well. Peter, yes, Peter. So Peter, 
in effect, he's already left, right? He's not necessarily connected to anyone else. Now, there's could be that could be for a variety of reasons, um, some of which are are, are not bad. But um, the point is, looking at this, we we you know, and our, again, our research would show that Peter is much more likely to leave than than anyone else. Um, let's try another one. Uh, who is best positioned to execute within the department? Who can get things done within within the department? Let's see what you guys think. Throw that in the chat. I see Alex, Alex, Alex. Yes, right? Alex has got um, strong relationships with everyone else in the department, which means things don't fall through the cracks, right? Everyone sort of understands each other's roles, um, et cetera. What about who has the best chance of coming up with creative new ideas? Sue, 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 yes. You guys are sociologists as well as chemists. Absolutely, right? Sue, because Sue is connected to all three groups, right? Sue has the opportunity to sort of identify disparate information and bring it together, combine it in unique ways and come up with really you know, creative ideas. And the research shows that actually that brokerage position, Sue is more likely to get paid more. Sue is more likely to get promoted. She's more likely to be perceived as a leader in the organization. And she's more likely to come up with uh, a greater quantity of higher quality creative ideas, right? So network position really matters. And again, Dan and I have done research um, in, in one organization uh, where we found network position was five times more predictive Dan hates it when I say this because Dan is a is a psychologist, um, but the sociologists love this, right? Network position is five times more predictive of of um, performance than your education, your cognitive ability, or your or your experience, um, which is is you know pretty pretty amazing. Um, so that's what we're really focused on when we talk about um, the, a leader's network, right? Where do they sit? In this in this network, um, and I'm sorry. And what is the pattern? You know, what is the nature of their individual network looks like? Has a dramatic impact on on their performance. A prop one problem we see is that you know most leaders. In fact, if you if you offer people uh, development in either hard skills like you know, data analytics, Python, etc., or in um, soft skills, right, relationship building. Um, you know, four to five times they will pick the hard skills when really the soft skills have a really significant effect. Um, and for the most part, we're not thinking about our networks. Uh, we're not thinking about our organizations as networks. And so we're operating with blinders on, which means we're not necessarily making or optimizing the decisions that we make. Um, we tend to think about organizations as uh, like the, uh, um, as we see here on the left, right, as either a set of reporting relationships, an organizational chart, or maybe a business proxy, a racy matrix, um, role profile, et cetera. You know, Dan and I would argue that's the theory around how work gets done, but the real world practice is, is what's on the right, right? It's the informal network. And in fact, uh, this is actual, this is real data. On the left-hand side, we see it looks like Stern is really not that, you know, he's not that high in the hierarchy, presumably not that important. But when you look on the right, what you realize is that he is the most central person in the network. And if you do the math behind that, you realize that he is the one who's actually connecting those three subgroups. So we don't know if that's, a, again, we don't know if that's a good or a bad thing. Um, but what we do know is if Stern were to win the lottery and leave the organization, it's going to have a, a massive impact around how this group, how this group operates. Um, so what I'd like you to do in, the, in, our, in our final minutes here, before we move to our q and I'd like you to just think about your own network, right? Um, and, you know, if you think about, you know, in, in, the, in the rows here, we have superiors, peers, and subordinates. In the columns, people in your own department, people in other parts of the organization where you work, people in outside your organization, partners, clients, you know, suppliers, et cetera. And think about you know, where you might, if you took the, the names of the folks who you have really strong relationships with, these are the people who um, would you, you would turn to you for help or the people whom if they, and you, would, and you would stop what you're doing to assist them, or if you got into a jam, you would turn to them, right? I want you to just quick think about where you would place those names. And um, Dan and I actually have uh, several different ways to think about how, to help you think about how you, um, you optimize your network, but I wanna give you one specific one. Uh, 
which is in, well, in terms of network size, right? So um, how many strong reciprocal, reciprocal relationships do high performing leaders sustain? Go ahead and put that in the chat. Is it, is it uh, less than 10, 10 to 19, 20 to 29, 30 to 39? Oh, we got a poll. Excellent. Thank you very much, Renee. I forgot about that. Go ahead and quickly take this poll and let me know where you think most high-performing leaders fall. And I'll just give you 10 more seconds. Okay, Renee, can we please see the results of that? Of that, Ah, oh, pretty good distribution here. All right, looks like the majority of those is 20 to 29. Well, the actual answer is 12 to 18, right? So um, every relationship that you maintain, there's a cost associated with it, right? It takes time and effort to, to, to maintain a relationship with, with folks. Uh, if you're if you sort of have less than than ten people or twelve people in your in your network, you may not be maximizing it the way that you could. If you've got more than eighteen, the danger is that you're overcommitted, right? So one of the things that we encourage is that folks really think about their own network in several ways, but but in terms, one of them is in terms of network size, so that they can really think about is their network optimized for the the business objectives and that they're trying to achieve and their and their career aspirations. Um, and we've got a we've got a cool worksheet that, uh, around um, sort of analyzing your own your own uh, personal leadership network. So if anyone wants access to that, by all means, please reach out to to Dan or I. We're happy to we're happy to provide that. Okay, thank you. So I think with that, we wanted to see what uh, questions that uh, you all might have um, in order to um, around the the conversation that we just had. So Anna, maybe I'll, I'll hand that over to you and you can help us um, facilitate that Q&A. Yes, definitely. Uh, at this point, I think some of the questions that came through have been resolved through, and uh, Renee, if you could, oh, Steve, can you bring us back into the room so that we could see you? Um, yep, terrific. Um, but um, as the questions, um, if there's time for everyone to, um, submit the questions. I want to uh, ask you a question. Please. You end your book with a statement about leadership in the quantum age. So this is how we know what not to do and what where we're at now. So give us a little bit of a trajectory into the future. How do you envision leadership continuing to evolve in the next in this century? Dan, you wanna you wanna take a crack at that or do you want me to? What oh I think you're on you're on mute, bud. Yeah. I think you're still on mute. So I, I guess that that means it's me. Okay. All right. Yeah, why don't you go ahead and then I'll I'll, I'll add my two cents. So, um, yeah, Anna, one of the things, so, so one of the, we, we interviewed a, a, a slew of, one of, the, one of the, 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 the best things about writing the book was the opportunity to talk to so many different, you know, compelling people. Um, and uh, one of the folks whom we, we talked to, um, you know, helps to run IBM Quantum, which is the, the quantum computing division of IBM. And they're, they're really world leaders in, in quantum computing. And what we were struck by was it was one of the best examples of um, a situation where, you know, there, 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 there are certainly no best practices associated with quantum computing, right? It is so new, it is so, um, it's so cutting edge that you they are really they are on the, the the frontier, right? And so they are forced to organize and lead in very different ways than you might in, in more stable or traditional, um, you know, sectors. Um, and there's a, there's a, we sort of conclude the book by sort of going through uh, uh, some of the things that they're doing, but um, their, their willingness, uh, just to, to talk about a couple, their, their willingness to, to publicly um, uh, declare um, where they're headed 
um, and um, you know, put a stake in the ground ar around that and um, their willingness to um, accept that mistakes are gonna happen along the way. Um, they're, they're, they're true scientists in that regard in that they, um, they're, they're much less concerned with whether they're right or wrong and they're much more concerned with, with, with what are they learning because the way that they're gonna stay ahead is by um, not just, not just uh, um, making mistakes and, and reflecting on those themselves, but sort of you know, incorporating an entire network and ecosystem around them that is willing to uh, you know, share with them um, you know, what's working, what's going wrong, how do they adapt. Um, and so you know, building that ecosystem um, and sort of, you know, uh, declaring for the entire industry where, where they're heading and um, owning their mistakes and adapting along the way, I think is one of, you know, is, is sort of several of the, of the encompasses several of the key um, uh, qualities that we see as being critical to leadership, you know, over the next century. Um, and we expect that that'll change as, as we go. So we would never say that we're the only ones who've got, you know, the answer, but um, that's certainly what we see currently. Dan, does that resonate with you? Yeah, ab absolutely. And I, I remember um, David Bryant, who um, is the um, COO for IBM's quantum computing group. He made the comment that when their company was acquired by IBM, IBM said something along the lines of, um, we want you to act like a startup, but think like IBM. Um, where it, and it reminded me of McKin there's a great McKinsey article um, that it's stabil agility rhymes with stability. And it's the idea that you need to have this um, balance between being really agile at the same time, creating enough stability for things to not just fall into chaos. And Steve talks a lot about um, you know, leading the organization to that edge of chaos, but not letting it fall into it. And we work with a range of different types of companies, some smaller owned private equity and VC companies. And then we work with the Verizons and Googles of the world. And um, the grass is always greener. The, the folks who are in these very um, well-developed, strong operational processes, companies with, with policies, um, they're always jealous of the folks sitting in these uh, small startups that can pivot very quickly and it can be incredibly agile. And the folks sitting in those offices look across the road at the Johnsons and Johnsons and Cisco's and think, oh my God, if we just had you know a third of that kind of structure and process, we'd be so much better off. And so there are these classic evolutions that um, organizations go through and leaders need to be able to um, manage that tension. And there's a lot of really interesting literature out there that, that we've been influenced by that comes out of the work that Michael Arena and some of his colleagues do around um, leadership complexity, which is what really what we're talking about. How do you lead in that, um, you know, in, in these new environments where things are so, so complex? So Every, everything Steve said with that little cherry on top. Great. A couple of questions came through as people are, you know, processing what they've heard. Um, Melanie is asking in a very practical sense, if you are within an organization, those 12, 18 relationships, uh, how do they distribute between being internal vis-a-vis -vis external? It, it depends a lot on the context. So if you're in a, if you're in a large, you know, or if you're in a large organization, the vast majority of those are going to be internal. But we're we're all familiar with um, with folks or ourselves have been in the position where something happens to our organization and we realize we we've, we've been solely invested in in the, you know an internal network and suddenly we've got nowhere to turn for for help, right? Um, also, I think what one of the things we see is, you know, if, you know, if all of your relationships are internal to the organization, you know, it's sort of an, it sort of becomes a, the danger is you have an echo chamber, right? You have groupthink. Um, so you certainly want um, 
you want to, and in fact, we, we talk about network shape as being another dimension you can use to, to assess your network. And really that's around the degree to which it's really close, close and tightly knit, um, which is great for getting things done, as we saw in the case of, of Alex and our little example, or um, the, 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 other, the other extreme is you have a, a tremendous, you know, all of your, your relationships are to you know, diverse external others, right? Non-redundant contacts, which is great for coming up with new ideas. Um, and so depending on what you want to achieve, one or the other of those might be better. But in most cases, uh, the, the best is sort of the combination of both, the hybrid, the small world network, which is a close knit group with uh, a few non-redundant external connections to make sure that you're constantly getting a flow of, of, of new ideas and new information. We, we've done some interesting cross-company cohort work uh, with leaders from different companies who've had the opportunity to uh, work closely together in these co-learning environments. And as part of that, they're getting signals from out, you know, outside of their own network that are very useful for them. And, and there's a great piece in, in the uh, in the chapter on it's not just about you, about someone from Verizon named Ivan Berg, who was able to solve a key problem because he had some of those external uh, connections. Excellent. I am just being aware of time, but uh, uh, please, um, Dan and Steve, you're going to be getting a lot of connections and invitations to be guest speakers in our classes. Um, and we will continue to stay in touch with you. Thank you very much. Very thought provo uh, provoking. And I have to say the book is very, very compelling. Uh, I highly recommend. So um, just a quick uh, reminder to everyone uh, on this beat, November 9th, we all have our own Rajama Krishna Murthy um, from Microsoft to talk about how Microsoft is developing AI strategy as it relates to um, human capital management. Thank you all very much for attending. You're going to receive a recording of this um, presentation and Dan and Steve, uh, we are very grateful for making the time for us this afternoon. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Anna, for having us. Thank you, Anna. I really appreciate it. Thanks everyone. Thanks everybody. Thank you.